In this section of Chapter 5, we're going to talk specifically about the scientific method for measuring heat flow, which is calorimetry. Let's start off our discussion on calorimetry by considering a hot piece of metal, we'll call it M, and cold water W. So here's M, my hot piece of metal, and this beaker, which is just the water. If the metal is placed in the water, the heat will transfer from the metal to the water. That is called heat flow. The temperature of the metal will decrease. The temperature of the water will increase. Eventually, both objects will have the same temperature thermal equilibrium. Okay? So we consider our system as M, and we consider the water as our surroundings in this case. So the heat lost by the metal is equal to the heat gained by the water. So we just put some subscripts down here. If that's true, because of the law of conservation of energy, the amount of heat that is lost by the metal plus the amount of heat gained by the water must be equal to zero. If we don't have any heat gained or heat lost, one big problem with this setup is that heat can also flow from the beaker to another set of surroundings, sort of the surroundings around the beaker. Okay, So we actually need a device so that we can isolate the heat flow process. So we can actually say that my heat lost by the metal is actually equal to the heat gained by the water, and we don't sort of complicate things by the heat loss outside of our whole system and surroundings. So let's talk about our system surroundings one more time. The substance or substances undergoing the chemical or physical change is called our system. In the case of our beaker, that is just this sort of metal cube. The surroundings is all other matter, including the components of the measurement apparatus. So it includes our beaker. It includes everything else here. Okay, so that would be in an ideal system. It would be just our water and our beaker. But a calorimeter is actually designed to minimize any heat flow out of our system, out of our water, and be outside of our metal. Okay, so. We do that by disinsulating our system very well, which minimizes the amount of heat flow outside of the system and the surroundings. So the change in temperature inside the calorimeter is converted now into the amount of heat transferred between the system to the surroundings. Because I know that my heat is constant, so my heat of my system which is the heat of my metal, must be equal to minus the heat of my surroundings or the water here. So when two objects of different temperatures are placed in contact with, with each other inside of a calorimeter, heat flows from the material of higher temperature to the material of lower temperature. And the amount of heat lost by the hot material equals the amount of heat gained by the cold material conservation of energy, conservation of heat flow. Okay. So here is an example of a very simple calorimeter, which actually works pretty well in the lab, believe it or not. It literally is this two styrofoam cups that have a cover on it. So here I have my surroundings, which is the water, and I have my system, which is the metal. I've also stuck in there a thermometer so I can measure the amount of heat being transferred. And I've also stuck in this little stirrer here, which is used to mix the water up. So since heat is exchanged inside the calorimeter, and we're sort of under the assumption that heat is not transferred outside of the styrofoam cup, and that might be a big assumption, Heat is only exchanged between the metal and the water. Therefore, the net change in heat is zero. So Q sub metal plus Q sub W is equal to zero. We rearrange that again. 
we can rearrange that so m equals negative q sub w. So which one loses heat? See, the metal loses heat, so q sub m better be equal to a negative value. Water gains heat, so it better be equal to a positive value. Remember, this sometimes this is hard to actually keep track of, but they have to have opposite signs. We'll talk about heat loss and heat gained and negative and positive in a few more examples here as we move through the chapter. Hopefully it's obvious that scientists do not typically use styrofoam cups to measure heat flow. They actually purchased commercial calorimeters where the insulation and the heat flow outside of the system, outside of the surroundings is negligible. So I have a much better calorimeter. In fact, if I look at this calorimeter, instead of using a thermometer, I'm using a precision thermocouple and a very low mass stirring motor and my insulation is very good. So we typically assume in these cases that the heat loss outside the system, outside the surroundings is actually negligible. But if we needed to make very precise measurements, we could actually calibrate our calorimeter by measuring a number of known materials with known heat capacities over a period of time to actually determine how much heat is actually lost as a function of time. So we can use that value to actually correct for any measurements that we make. Here is actually a picture of a very special calorimeter called a bomb calorimeter used for measuring the amount of energy in food products. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this section of this chapter. So heat flow from a system to the surroundings can either be a physical process like dropping in a chunk of metal into this calorimeter, or it could actually be a chemical process. I mix two chemicals together here and I measure the change in temperature, which tells me the amount of energy that is either flowed into the system or out of the system. We use calorimeters all the time to actually measure the heat flow in a chemical reaction, and it uses the same principles that we would use for physical processes, like water and a chunk of metal. Because energy is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction, heat produced or consumed by the chemical reaction, we're going to call this Q subreaction now, plus the heat absorbed or lost by the solution, we'll call those the surroundings now, and that's typically a solution in a calorimeter, so we'll call it Q sub solution, must also be equal to zero. We can then rearrange that equation, and if I know the heat of reaction is equal to negative heat of solution. So depending on whether it's absorbed or whether it's lost by the solution. This whole concept here of heat lost and heat gained is at the heart of all calorimetry problems and calorimetry calculations. Let's look at an example of a chemical reaction in which we have heat flow. An example in this case is that our system we're going to call the chemical reaction and we're going to carry this reaction out in water so we're going to call our surroundings water so we're going to look at the heat transferred from the chemical reaction to the surroundings. Remembering that we have can either have an exothermic process where our chemical reaction loses heat okay that means that my heat transfer of my reaction must be negative because I'm losing that heat. Or I can have an endothermic process, which means I'm gaining heat. I have to put energy into my system for the chemical reaction to occur. In that case, my heat flow for my reaction is going to be a positive value. I'm actually, my system gains the heat. Again, keeping in mind what is my system and what are my surroundings okay 
in these chemical reactions, the system is going to transfer or absorb heat into my surroundings. So let's say I have an exothermic reaction. It's going to actually give up heat, and it's going to give it up to my surroundings. So the heat of my reaction is going to be negative. It's going to lose heat, whereas my surroundings are going to get hotter. My temperature increases. In an endothermic reaction, I need to put heat into my system. So in this case, my heat of reaction is going to be a positive value. In other words, I got to put energy into the system. In this case, my temperature of my surroundings or my water goes down. Take the time to review that over and over again so it becomes second nature to you. It's a hard concept to grasp sometimes. I have a hard time grasping that concept every time I teach this chapter. Let's look at a specific example of calorimetry of a physical process first. I take a 360 gram piece of steel and I drop it into 425 milliliters of water. That water is at 24.0 degrees C and we're all inside a calorimeter. I'm measuring the temperature of the water as a function of time and I wait until that temperature has leveled off or reached equilibrium. In other words, my steel is now at the same temperature as my water and they're both at 42.7 degrees C. Let's assume that the specific heat of steel is approximately 0.449 joules per gram per degree C. Actually, I just went and looked that up in a table. I also need to know the specific heat of water. I went and looked that up in a table also. We also need to make the assumption that the heat transferred occurs only between the rebar and the water. There is no heat exchange with the outside environment. In other words, we're in a very good calorimeter. What we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the initial temperature of the piece of the rebar. I know that the heat given off by the rebar is actually equal to negative the heat taken up by the water. So the rebar loses heat, it's a negative sign, and the water gains heat. It, on the other side of the equation, is equal to positive. I can write this in more scientific notation by using Q rebar is equal to minus Q water. Substituting in my equation for heat flow, I have the specific heat of the rebar times the mass of the rebar times the temperature change of the rebar, I know it's initial and final temperature, is equal to negative specific heat of water times the mass of the water times the change in temperature of the water. My values, so let's see, here's my final equation again. So I know the density of water is one gram per milliliter, so I can actually plug in the mass of water now because it's going to be 425 grams. So I'm just doing some unit conversion to get everything in the correct units. There is nowhere within my heat flow equation where I have milliliters. I got to convert it to grams. Noting that the final temperature of both the rebar are now 42.7 degrees C, they're at equilibrium, I can start putting in my values. The specific heat of the metal, the mass of the metal, the final temperature of the metal. I don't know the initial temperature, I just heated it up the specific heat capacity of my water, the mass of my water, the final temperature of my water, and the initial temperature of my water. Do some mathematics. Solve for T initial. I get T initial was 248 degrees C. And that sort of makes sense, sort of from a common sense type of perspective, the metal had to be hotter because the water warmed up. Let's do another example, and this time let's do an example where we undergo an acid-base chemical reaction. 
if I take 50 milliliters of a one molar hydrochloric acid solution and mix that with 50 milliliters of a one molar sodium hydroxide solution, they undergo an acid base reaction as shown down here in this reaction equation here. Both of them start off at 22 degrees Celsius, so that's my initial temperature. And I mix them, and I assume that I instantaneously mix them. That's not 100% true, but it's very close. So I mix them together in a calorimeter, and I then watch the temperature until it reaches a maximum or an equilibrium temperature of 28 point nine degrees Celsius so this actually the temperature went up so it is an exothermic reaction so heat is given off by the reaction so the heat of my reaction it better be negative so heat of reaction equals a negative number okay so let's continue now and actually let's see my heat of solution I'm taking my heat flow equation here is going to be equal to negative here I just have my solution now. I look at the specific heat of my solution, and let's make the assumption that it's water. So I know its specific heat is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. My mass of my solution now, I have 50 milliliters of each. Let's also assume that my density of my solution, because it's mostly water, is 1.0 grams per milliliter. So I have 100 grams now of my solution. But I know my temperature change. Let's substitute those all in now. I have my specific heat of water, which is a estimate for the specific heat of my acidic and basic solution. I have a 100 grams total of both solutions combined and I have my final temperature minus my initial temperature that works out to be minus 2.9 times 10 to the third joules and so in this case the negative sign indicates that this reaction is exothermic or it gets warm it gets hot Let's do another example. I have a 215 gram block of copper that is at 505.0 degrees C. I plunge it into 1,000 grams of water. That water is at 23.4 degrees C and it is actually in my calorimeter. I want to calculate the final temperature, my equilibrium temperature, that both the water and the copper come to. I need to know a few things here. I need to know the specific heat of my copper. I can go look that up in a table. I need to know the specific heat of my surroundings. In this case, it's water. I can go look that up in a table, but I'm beginning to actually know it a little bit now because I've seen it so often. It's 4.184 joules per gram per, time, per degree C. So I take my calorimetric equation where I take my Q of my copper is equal to minus Q of my water because I'm losing heat here. And so in this case, I take and I start plugging in values. Here's my specific heat for my copper times the mass of my copper. I don't know the final temperature. That's what we're going to solve for. But I do know the initial temperature of my copper. It's 505 degrees Celsius. That's going to be equal to the heat change in my water. I take my specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree C, times the mass of my water, times the final temperature, which we're solving for again, minus my initial temperature of water. Go through the algebra. And it takes a few minutes. I find out the final temperature, which I calculate, is 33.4 degrees C. If I did this experiment in the laboratory and I had a good calorimeter, this value is very, very accurate. So it's a good methodology for calculating final temperatures.
I mentioned earlier that there is a calorimeter called a bomb calorimeter, and it is used to measure the energy produced by reactions that yield large amounts of heat and gaseous products, such as combustion reactions. So, in this type of calorimeter, it's actually a very robust calorimeter because the word bomb, it is literally a bomb. I take a sample and I put it down here inside this calorimeter. So it's sort of like in this little metal cup. And then I have two electrodes in here and I put a very high voltage on them and it literally burns whatever in there very fast. It produces gas and at the same time it produces heat. And then that heat is transferred from this cup over to the water. I measure the heat that is transferred. And because we're in a calorimeter, I can actually use that change in temperature and my heat capacity of my calorimeter to actually calculate the amount of heat that is produced in this chemical reaction. And this is the type of calorimeter that we use for measuring the calories in our food products here. It's very exciting when that bomb goes off. Let's now look at an example of calculating the amount of energy or the amount of heat that is created when we actually burn something. And specifically, let's look at a gummy bear. So we take a 0.88 gram gummy bear and we burn it inside a bomb calorimeter. The temperature of the water started at 21.5 degrees and then it leveled off at 24.2. Notice it's not a very big change. So I have to have a very good calorimeter in order to do these experiments because the temperature change is so small. The manufacturer of the bomb calorimeter has done a number of experiments where they have a known amount substance with a known specific heat, and they've calculated the heat capacity of the calorimeter to be 11.4 kilojoules per degree C. I can then just take our experimental values and plug them into this, where I'm now gonna calculate my heat transferred so I know the heat capacity of our calorimeter, I know the temperature change, I can calculate the amount of heat that is produced, that's 30.78 kilojoules. I then know the mass of my gummy bear so I can actually calculate the amount of mass per, the amount of energy per gram, it would be 34.98 kilojoules per gram. If I wanted to calculate nutritional calories, I know that one big C calorie equals 4.184 kilojoules. I can just do that relationship, that conversion factor. Each gummy bear in this bag over here has 7.36 calories per gummy bear. We do this experiment all the time in organic chemistry lab or in physical chemistry lab because it's kind of fun to do. Scientists have come up with what we call whole body calorimeters, and there are various designs, but they're large enough to hold a whole human being. These calorimeters are used to measure metabolism of individuals, metabolism being just chemical reactions in the body, and they do it under different conditions to get some statistics on sort of what are the effects of environmental conditions on metabolism? What are the effects of dietary changes on metabolism? What are the effects of health conditions on metabolism, such as diabetes? So essentially, it's just a big calorimeter that's very well insulated, and we literally measure the heat that is transferred from the body to my surroundings. And here is actually a picture of some scientists back in the 80s measuring calorimetry on human beings. Let's do one more example 
where we use calorimetry to actually identify an unknown metal. I take this chunk of metal and I weigh it. It has a mass of 33.590 grams. I heat it up in a test tube and I heat it to 100 degrees 0.21 degrees Celsius. That's just the temperature of the water that's boiling here. And so then I take that metal ingot and I plunge it immediately into my calorimeter. My calorimeter in this case is just two styrofoam cups with some water in it. Those cups contain 76.367 grams of water. That water is at 23.42 degrees C. And then I just measure the change in temperature of that water, the final temperature. It rises up to 26.42 degrees Celsius. I now want to calculate what the specific heat of the metal is, and then I'll go to a table, look up that specific heat, and I might be able to identify that metal. So now use our equation for calorimetry, where we're looking at the exchange of heat from the metal to the heat of the water. I substitute in my values. I'm going to solve for the specific heat of my metal. I know the mass of the metal. I know the final temperature of the metal, the initial temperature of the metal. I know the specific heat of water, the initial mass of water, the final temperature of water, and the initial temperature of water. I go through and do all the mathematics. I now calculate the specific heat of my metal to be 0.3863 joules per gram degree C. I go to the table and I suspect that my metal is actually copper from this methodology. It's kind of cool.